I'd like to introduce you to the letter X. It's not the latest iPhone, nor the Roman numeral 10, and it's not the X in TEDx. It's where hidden treasure lies, and it's the shape of a person, a fully embodied, purposeful, creative, self-aware, and ethical person. But how do we solve for X? Well, first, we need to talk about I-shaped people. An I-shaped person is someone who's acquired a lot of knowledge through the head, resulting in deep specialist expertise. The system was designed, really, to focus on the left hemisphere of the brain. The left side performs tasks like logic, language, writing, science, and math, ignoring right side skills like creativity, intuition, and holistic thought. Our education system was designed to turn us into eyes. And simply adding technology doesn't change this old model much. Eyes can be linear in our feeling and thinking, and therefore how we communicate. Eyes are one-dimensional, one-directional to work, to college, to military, shopping, or prison, with few exceptions. Laws by design have made us this way, segregated, and siloed, and isolated. Eyes play out competition, even if we value collaboration. Yet the world we live in now requires more collaboration, more communication, and more creativity than ever. We need to move beyond the I. So Tim Brown is the co-founder of international design firm IDEO. Back in 2010, he proposes a new ideal-shaped human, the T. The T has both depth and breadth in skills. And what makes a T special is, quote, empathy. Empathy is important because it allows you to imagine the problem from another perspective, to stand in somebody else's shoes. So how might a T-shaped person approach a problem? IDEO uses a practice called design thinking, here illustrated by the Stanford D School. Design thinking is a creative problem-solving practice where you're encouraged to focus on the people who will be using the solution. It follows a series of consistent steps. First, you empathize, you define the problem, you ideate, prototype, and test. Right, so you might not think of yourselves as designers, but if you make any decisions about how things are done or how things are made, you are one. Right, are there any parents in the room? OK, some enthusiastic, some reluctant. <laughs> Have you ever designed a hack to get your kids to eat their vegetables or go to bed on time? Right? Congratulations, you're a designer. All right, about 10 years ago, I designed this really cool shop class for my 11th graders, 16-year-olds, to redesign a classroom for second graders, 7-year-olds. So my students follow the design thinking process. They empathize with the teacher and the second graders through classroom observations and interactive interviews. My students then defined their juicy question. How might we design and build a classroom that's both flexible for the teacher and inspiring for the students. My students then ideated all the ways to approach that question. They then designed and built quick and cheap prototypes to engage the second graders in order to test their designs. Right, this is the result. It's pretty cool. Rewind about four months when my 11th graders presented their desk prototype to the second graders. One second grader after another, sat at that desk, totally unimpressed. <laughs> Until little Mina, she says, did you not listen to a word we said? <laughs> that desk needs to fit us, not you. My students were crushed. They followed the design thinking process, but they baked their bias into the design. They built it to fit an 11th grader. 
Luckily, they had little Mina to learn from, and luckily, the courage to voice hadn't been designed out of her yet. Design thinking is an incredibly powerful process with some incredible outcomes. But at its super fast pace, we make mistakes like not pausing to slow down and reflect on who we are as designers with the good and harmful biases in all of us. And not pausing to slow down to reflect on who we are, of baking our bias into our designs is not just a risk of design thinking, it's a risk of focusing on T-shaped people. The complexities of our time don't just ask us to be knowledgeable, to have skills in matters of the head, even if it is deep and broad. The complexities of our time require empathetic, embodied, and equity-driven humans. We need X-shaped humans. And luckily, that X exists in all of us. That human is rich in story. This is our truth, our family, our history. In New Zealand, you would call this your pepeha. This human is rich in strengths. Outside academic abilities, these intrinsic strengths light up every room that we enter. These are where our dignity live, and no one can take them from us. These give us a solid foundation of courage from which to build new skills, a new understanding of ourselves, of each other, and of the world. So practicing these skills with our dignity, we can find our stance, and our stance guides our designs. You see what I just made? <laughs> right? The X-shaped human is what Sir Ken Robinson tasked us to build in his 2006 TED Talk, Do Schools Kill Creativity? Where he states, our task is to build the whole student so that they can face this future. When practiced, our story, our strengths, our skills, and our stance, they all work together to build that embodied, purposeful, self-aware, creative, an ethical human. And doesn't that sound like somebody that you want to work with, or live with, or learn with? I know I do. So there are a myriad of tools to get to the letter X, but let's explore how design thinking can be adapted to achieve this. I offer liberatory design. It's a hack of design thinking for liberation, developed in collaboration with the National Equity Project and the Stanford D School's K-12 lab. We added the notice phase, which is a time to practice self-awareness of your identity, your emotions, your values, your biases. We've also added reflect, which is transparent and ongoing throughout the design process, and ask us to slow down and build our learning together. And with practice, it looks like this. It's happening all of the time at our core. Slowing down to reflect on who we are is really, really hard in this high-paced world. So I use something called an equity pause, coined by Caroline Hill, Michelle Molitor, and Christine Ortiz from Equity by Design. An equity pause is a time to push pause and notice power dynamics and oppressive habits that are at play due to race, class, gender, ability, belief, religion, and so on. It's a time to examine and interrupt these habits so that we can unleash equity-driven creativity. So how does this work in action? About a year ago, the Stanford D School asked if I would work with the school district on the Dead Sea in Israel. Ben, the principal, wanted design thinking all over his school. And he wanted a makerspace, and he wanted it to be the edu innovation epicenter of Israel. All of those things are my jam. So I said, yes, please, but I won't be practicing design thinking. Given that you'll be designing for trust across power dynamics between students and teachers, teachers and administration, men and women, Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis, you're going to need something a bit stronger than design thinking. This is a job for X-shaped people. This is a job for liberatory design. So Ben and I had many equity pauses to practice self-awareness and build relational trust. 
And the result, he says, my failure is thinking that everybody is like me. It's a good start, but we kept going. I shadowed Ben to gain empathy for him as a leader. I also wanted to get into the classrooms and feel the energy. And this is what I saw. The apathy felt violent. My heart sank. The students' dignity and learning spirit were being violated, and therefore they reciprocated with disrespect, disruption, and disengagement. The teachers had given up, and so had the students. There were countless signs that the students were unhappy, from graffiti, heckling teachers, rolled eyeballs, or even getting up and walking out. But months later, Ben and his team defined their juicy question. How might we engage the unmotivated and disengaged students in Getty High School? Well, we designed the students, invited and designed the students into the design process and kept them there. We used the X-shaped model to allow teachers and students to reflect on their story, their strengths, their skills, and their stance, and share it with each other. You can't plagiarize this emergent trust and joy. We also had teachers follow a student to gain empathy for a student's experience. We had that same student follow that same teacher. We did this to level the playing field and experiment with transformational trust and empathy. Students and teachers then worked together to design and build prototypes, approaching issues of engagement that both faced in school. So months later, what did we hear from students? One said, shadowing my teacher gave me a deeper understanding of the emotional price of being a teacher. And another said, I felt seen and heard. And I wish all students got to experience this. When was the last time you heard a teenager talk about school this way? This is what an X-shaped student sounds like. And no, the school's problems are not all solved, but the door to creative possibilities has been opened, and it hasn't shut yet. So there's hope. So if you are able and willing, will you please stand up? All right. Acknowledge your I. It's in all of us by design. Celebrate your T. Yes, you might have to touch each other. <laughs> all right. And pause and imagine all the ways to liberate the X in you and each other. No, equity does not exist yet on this planet, but together, we can design it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>